Live from Beijing, I'm Tian Wei. China has spelled out guidance on meeting its carbon commitments in the next decades. The country aims to hit peak emissions before 2030 and become carbon neutral by 2060. The guideline lays out the overarching principles, the groundwork of all upcoming policies. It says major progress is expected in the next eight years in China's transition to a green economy. The plan aims to have energy consumption in key industries to be at optimum levels based on global standards. By 2030, according to the plan, China expects to be way past the tipping point of sustainable and efficient systems that power its economy. The guideline also was clear on having non-fossil fuel energy account for almost 80 percent of China's total consumption. That's actually a very exciting plan. To talk about that, I'm joined in Washington, D.C., Wu Changhua, China Director of the Office of Jeremy Rifkin, and in Berlin via Skype, Michael Melling, Deputy Director of the Center for Energy and Environmental Policy Research with MIT. What a pleasure to see both of you, ladies and gentlemen. It's great news. The blueprint is out, long expected. What can we read out of all of these numbers that are printed out in the blueprint. Uh, Ms. Wu, very briefly first. It's a very s significant and also exciting move forward. And from the national government, no now we have clearly defined, uh, I call like a bending the curve decarbonization plan, uh, that the government really started to put the two targets, capping emissions before 2030 and uh, carbon neutrality before 2060, at the core of all government policy making process. Right. The plan has laid out and also details actually to deliver that. It's fascinating to see the progress. Before 2030, before 2060, the before is very exciting. But let me just go through some of the specific numbers Ms. Wu just talked about. You know, energy consumption per unit of GDP will be lower by 13.5 percent from 2020 level by 2025 I'm talking about uh, carbon dioxide emissions per unit of GDP will be lowered by 18 percent from 2020 level the share of non-fossil energy consumption will be reaching around 20 percent the forest coverage uh, 20 4.1 percent forest stock volume will rise into 18 billion cubic meters these are sheer numbers but these numbers actually say a lot of things mr melling well to me what i take out of this blueprint and first of all thank you for having me is it's great china recognizes you. the sheer scope and scale of the challenge um and with this long-term vision and all the steps on the path towards that long-term goal um, it's showing that it takes the, the challenge seriously, and it's it is a challenge. And I think many other countries, you know, are embarking on the same journey. There will be different ways to get there, but very clearly, China has calculated sort of how it will get there step by step. Mm. They have calculated very carefully because this is, has been a long expected uh, plan, uh, Ms. Wu. Uh, I mean, among the plan, the ways to get there is as important as you know the degrees to which to work for. Uh, for example, prioritizing conservation leverage the strengths of government and the market. Uh, meanwhile, coordinating efforts on domestic and international fronts. This sounds a little bit abstract, but I know you would explain to us a little bit later. And guarding against the risks. Uh, among all of these principles, uh, which do you see is most critical? Uh, there are definitely many numbers actually in the current blueprint, but if you look carefully, you could pretty much actually identify three major levers actually the government is going to move ahead in terms of the actions. One is decoupling, decoupling growth and with energy consumption, uh, with also carbon uh, uh, intensity there as well. And the second actually lever or pillar actually is really switching, switching away from coal and more and more replaced by uh, non-fossil fuel energies there. And the third pillar, of course, is in, uh, called like nature-based solutions, particularly emphasizing the importance, actually, ecosystem functions, actually, of the forest there. So it's not confusing. Those are the three major pillars, actually, numbers of targets in the current plan. 
And in terms of energy efficiency, I think you know there are lots of still a lot of low hanging fruits there. I think energy conservation or energy efficiency has been and will continue to be one of the major drivers actually to deliver the agenda, yeah. even though it's getting more difficult in a way because it requires more technology innovation and the financing there as well. But in the meantime, if you look at the you know, dramatic drop of uh, so, you know, solar energies, uh, renewable energies there, so they are becoming gradually low hanging fruits part as well, plus energy storage among others there. So mm. in, a, in a nutshell, I think it is clear uh, it's integrated and we know for sure, at least I have the confidence that the blueprint or the goal is set to succeed and not set for failure. Right. We already see Mr. Melling, both the carbon market in operation in China. Of course, now at this moment, it's still the lower hanging fruit of the carbon trading. On the other hand, we also see the government is not likely to cap any, uh, you know, uh, limit in terms of the uh, electricity price uh, for those uh, high energy uh, consumption industries. So a lot of uh, signals are indicating to us that this plan is not a joke. It is really about step by step to get there. Well, yes, um, I think, you know, what you what you're hinting at, what you're alluding to is the fact that it becomes a challenge and it becomes more expensive and more difficult to continue to survive for a number of energy intensive um, industries in particular. And different countries, different jurisdictions, including, say, the European Union, I'm right now in Europe, mm -hmm. have, of course, sought to shield them and have over time had various tools at their disposal and used like free allocation of these tradable units to protect industry. But at some point we all recognize we can no longer protect because we have to expose them to the signals, to the incentives towards decarbonization. And that's a difficult transition. So I applaud China if you know it's already spelling out that transformation will be necessary and there will not be protection throughout the whole path towards decarbonization. We are already feeling the pinch, quote unquote, a little bit. Uh, Ms. Wu, for example, about the so-called uh, uh, electricity or energy crisis that's also have its impact on China. But at this point, we know that there is investigation about the coal prices. There's also uh, a lot of uh, things uh, being discussed at government and the government industry level about how prices are being set. Uh, what is the quote unquote crisis really like? Uh, Ms. Wu, how do you see these uh, very different directions of signals uh, uh, together with the coming out of this uh, blueprint. Well, I think the current energy crunch or power shortage in China has been experiencing definitely has exposed the difficulties and complexities of the you know, energy system uh, management and transformation. And uh, yes, we have policies driving around the carbon intensity, around the energy efficiency, and trying to drive the switch from fossil fuels to non-fossil fuels. But somehow uh, there are other elements around energy security, around you know, essential services access, or justice equity issues in the energy system there, mm. so that we have to make sure we address them as well. So on one side, I think it definitely poses the challenges, but in the meantime, actually offer the opportunity for decision makers to understand it, mm. understand the complexities so that we'll be able to make the right directions. Right. So that people have a sound plan already in their mind. It's not going to be just about the goals. It's also about how to get there. Another important question, Ms. Wu, uh, that you heard at the, uh, uh, fifth, the anniversary celebrating uh, the 50th uh, anniversary of China's uh, resumption, restoration of lawful seat of the United Nations uh, being held uh, uh, on Monday in Beijing. Chinese President Xi Jinping once again pledged about China's efforts in terms of uh, leading up to COP26 and also in terms of uh, carbon targets. Uh, what among those words uh, to you is the most concrete, uh, particularly when you look at the plan that we have on hand? Well, I definitely see the commitment, uh, political commitment in particular from Chinese leadership in terms of the transition. And uh, we all recognize more than ever China has to transform and uh, its infrastructure, its energy system, okay. as well as in, you know, its whole economy there. So it's the level of confidence that the political leaders in China 
has offered actually to its All own right. people, but also to the international community, that China is seriously taking the action. All right, we've got 30 seconds only left. Uh, Mr. Melling, tell me more about what would the, all these mean leading up to COP26? Well, stepping back, you know, I feel we look at what different countries bring to Glasgow um, in, in a week's time. And I think some actors like the European Union, they come with a strong, strong luggage, a strong suitcase full of measures. They have the European Green Deal. They have the Fit for 55 uh -huh. package, etc. The U.S., it's a little bit less clear because, as you know, President Biden has had quite some difficulties getting through some of his legislative measures, including climate policy. For China, I also feel rather comfortable. Okay. You not only have the new ETS, but you also have this plan. They come with a strong plan, yes, definitely. We'll see how things would develop leading up to COP26. For now, thank you so much for both of you. Wu Changhua, Michael Melling, all the best. Thank you.